Welcome to Clothing Culture, a fashion industry podcast at the intersection of technology and innovation. I'm Emily Lane. And I'm Brett Schnitger. We speak with experts and disruptors who are moving the industry forward. And discuss solutions to real industry challenges. Clothing Culture is brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global design and production house with more than 30 years of experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. We find ourselves once again on the hillside of Hollywood Hills. It feels very glamorous to be here, doesn't it, Brett? It's a beautiful day. Absolutely. Well, we have a wonderful guest today that came to us by way of one of our podcast friends, Joshua Williams. We're so excited to welcome um, the founder of Not Just a Label, Stefan Siegel. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Brett, one of the things that you often talk about is um, fashion designers, how they're like artists, you know, uh, uh, like, like. They oh, are artists. Actually. They are. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, but rather than using paintbrushes, they use fabric. And, you know, one of the things that is a, another common denominator between artists and fashion designers is that often fashion designers kind of their voice really isn't heard. And what's wonderful about some of the work that Stefan is doing, he's really created a platform to give a voice to um, emerging designers. So I'm really excited to learn a little bit about this amazing community that you've developed and how it's disrupting the fashion industry. Of course. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, first of all, how you came to be in this industry and then this need that you saw to develop this platform. 2008, I think the fashion landscape was a completely different one than it was today. Um, uh, there were a few things where emerging designers were struggling with. It was visibility. Uh, first and foremost, there was not an online platform out there where you could actually discover emerging designers. And I found out about this problem because I was working in the finance side of fashion. So I was working for an investment bank called Merrill Lynch. And um, on behalf of our clients, we would find up and coming brands, which back then in 2008, the up and coming brands were Alexander McQueen and oh, Stella McCartney. One of my favorites. Her favorites. I happen and, to be wearing yeah. some Alexander today. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, those were companies with turnover somewhere between 15 and 20 million euros. Um, and I was wondering where are all the other kids and then looking also at the story or the history of Alexander McQueen, he graduated from Central St. Martins um, and for seven years, he kind of almost disappeared off the radar mm -hmm. before he then became the head designer of Givenchy. And I was wondering what happens in those seven years that it, on average it takes those designers to actually reemerge and have a profitable business or, um, you know, be in a leading position f designing for a different um, fashion house. And um, I found out that most of these design designers were using MySpace to actually present their collections, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you remember was slow and buggy and it wasn't the most professional way of, of showcasing It was your the designs. beginning of social media. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, yeah, so together with my brother, we were debating, you know, can we create the first social network, but for a specific industry, which means fashion design. And I presented that to uh, the actual of one of the universities in London, Central St. Martins, which probably mm -hmm. still today is one of the most important fashion design schools. And, and they told us, um, well, for years, we've been trying to create some sort of alumni network. So we know where these kids are two years after they leave school. And um, yeah, you know, it was one of those ideas that you have on a Sunday afternoon and usually you forget them by Monday morning, you know. Yeah. Um, and this one, this, way, this idea stuck and I quit my job and it took us almost a year to develop the platform, launched it. And initially we said we we're only going to partner with one university in London, which is Central mm -hmm. St. Martins and see if they can have their graduates signing up. Um, they sent out an email to all their alumni um, and quickly a second university, the Royal Academy in Antwerp did the same. And and yeah, within five months, we had over a thousand designers on the platform. Oh and there were some names that are household names today. So- um, and, did, and do they stay with you? Are they all, once they're on your platform, are they always there? Because it's kind of like this, this network? Yeah, so we have some brands who, you know, they're multi-million dollar brands now and they still have someone in their team update and not just label profile. Others ask us to take it down. Um, you know, other designers went on and work for big fashion houses and then unfortunately they need to sign agreements that they have to take mm. a profile down. 
but it doesn't matter for us it's we want to be there for the initial stages of those brands we want to be the first to discover the brands it's not so much about you know are you still there 10 years later yeah. um but yeah there's about 50,000 designers on the platform now from 150 oh countries goodness. yeah it's 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 a huge inflow of new talent as well so we're counting between 2 and 300 new designers every month um, and that's just on average. So during, let's say, graduate season, which starts sort of from April, goes all the way through to July, you know, there's at least 400, 500 new brands joining every month. And, and these designers use not just the label for a million reasons. So they come on there to just showcase their graduate collections. It's a bit like LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. They can show to their future employer, you know, what they're able to do. Other designers use our newly launched online store. So they actually want to sell direct to the consumer. Other designers use it because they know that a lot of stylists and buyers scout our platform to um, to find new designers. And then finally, we offer a lot of different opportunities and projects to those designers who are um, who are registered on our platform. So yeah, that's where we are. That is incredible. When so when was this founded, and how many like how many years has this platform been? So two thousand eight is when we launched, okay. and and yeah, it, and you know the platform has seen. Um, I don't I don't want to say we pivoted. I think the core idea is still the same. I think we just went through different phases of the business where, um, you know, for some time it looked like we are probably one of the coolest fashion events company out there because we did huge pop-up stores in Dubai, in Berlin, in New York. I mean, in New York City, we took over the Waldorf Astoria Tower just before they closed down. Um, so that was a project we did with um, the city of New York to promote the garment district. Um, so yeah, we were known for very large scale events around the world to promote emerging designers Mm -hmm. and they were mostly funded by regional development funds or the cities or the governments. Um, we did a lot of partnerships and consulting for other big brands as well. And, and yeah, and I think where we are now is just, we're focusing heavily on allowing designers to sell direct to consumer, which is something that when I speak to people outside of fashion, I always tell them. Um, you know, this is not rocket science because most brands sell direct to consumer. They sure. just open a store and sell sandwiches to somebody who wants to eat a sandwich. That's but right. in fashion, you have to, you know, the traditional system wants you to go through a PR agency and be good friends with an editor and mm-hmm. then get a sales agency. And then you can And most fashion designers agency. have plenty of money to do all that. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's a joke. So they unfortunately, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, the, the fashion has always favored the kids that come with a lot of money. Right. And it still does. And, and I think... Um, you know, our platform, it, it took so long. I mean, we wanted to have an online store or some sort of marketplace model for a very long time, but there was always a resistance from the industry, but also from the designers saying, I prefer to get a wholesale order from a retailer. <laughs> and I think with the pandemic, things changed and they realized, hold on, I'm not getting these orders. Um, I need to change my business slightly. I need to be able to, you know, package things nicely in my studio and, and, you know, not wait for fashion week, but actually just start selling, you know, mm-hmm. start making money. And they realized their profit margin is just so much bigger. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so we're focusing heavily on, on the retail side now. Um, so we've become an online retailer with the marketplace, but um, we have now also signed partnerships with gigantic retailers like Zalando in Europe or Nike Fashion in India and so many others who um, now want to have the products that we have on their online shop. So we definitely are doing something right. And I think the product offering that designers have to sell um, has not been seen by anyone else. So it's just a matter of how do we get it out there now? So for a large department store to embrace you guys, this whole trend towards storytelling and kind of farm to table meets, meets fashion, how does that process work for, you know, for basically, how does a large department store embrace a massive mm-hmm. community of diverse talent? Yeah. I'm sure, you know, you've got a wide spectrum of, of design within that. How do they go through that selection process? How do they how do they decide which designers they're going to bring in? And, and how does that logistics work? Yeah. So this is usually kind of the, the resistance that we feel from these retailers. They don't want to interact with so many young designers because they know that if they place an order with an established brand, then... It's a very easy process, yeah. and 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 obviously, you know, I think there's this sort of um, false <laughs> argument that young designers cannot deliver, or they deliver late, or there's always problems around that. And and I I, I 
I think, you know, I can speak from experience now because we partnered with um, Europe's biggest fashion retailer called Zalando. Um, and they, in September last year during Milan Fashion Week, they launched their luxury division, so Zalando Designer. And as part of that, not just the label now has a section on their platform. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, a gigantic retail platform. And we managed to create a virtual showroom for them so hmm. their buyers can go in and buy directly from the designers. So they fil- they go through our website as they would go through a trade show, they would go to um, a fashion week. They come to us and say, we love these 200 designers. We then approach them, we take them through an application process, they upload their line sheets and um, Zalando places the order directly uh, through our platform and the designers deliver to one warehouse that we work with in Germany. Um, where all of these different orders coming from all around the world will be inspected and then they're loaded onto one truck and Zalando interacts with one party, which is us. Um, The benefit is they get product that no other retailer in the world is selling right now. Um, and, and, and I think that's and where you have, have a, a massive huge... community of pretty happy designers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you the know. designers get paid through us. So the guarantee is we have special pay- payment terms agreed with Zalando. So we, um, we're almost like an escrow agent in this case. So we make sure the designer will not be ripped off, which is also unfortunately a tragic sure. part of fashion wholesale for young of designers. Course. Yeah. Um, and that can and, devastate them. I mean, correct. they're yeah. hand to mouth many. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think you know it's it's the power of 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 this collective is huge now, and and that's why we were able to you know negotiate with one of the biggest retailers in the world payment terms that are favorable to our designers. That would be unheard of if that one little kid would, you know, would go to Zalando and try to negotiate that um, by themselves. Yeah, it's it's just an amazing thing when you think about what you've put together. Where, you know, speaking with Josh, he you know at Parsons, he said there's just this amazing stable of amazing kids that are creating some great stuff and they're never going to see success. They're yeah. just, and and many of the reasons are exactly what we talk about. There's so many things in the way, you know, there's mm-hmm. focused fashion weeks and only a few select get it. And now you've kind of democratized fashion where yeah. everyone's on a level playing field. They have the ability to be visible. Um, and, you know, we talk about that all the mm-hmm. time. We talk about, you know, when COVID hit, we were on the phone almost day one of COVID around the world talking mm-hmm. to designers. They were the first to be let go. They're the silent face between, yeah. you know, behind many ma- massive mm-hmm. brands. And they were disposable. It was mm-hmm. kind of like, hey, things are tough. We're going to lay you off. We'll pick you up if, if business comes back. And they're so creative, they don't have the ability to really market themselves. They're like, they want to go and do their thing, but they need the help and support from a business standpoint. And yeah. it's just kind of amazing you've put this together. And I think, you know, it it, it furthers kind of the the evolving culture of fashion as we see it today. One, mm-hmm. it is a glo- it's more of a global business than it's ever been before. I think people celebrate... Um, you know, smaller, unique, you know, viewpoints, you know, as consumers are driving fashion today and what they're, what they're liking, sustainability is a big conversation. And and you've even mentioned that's a big platform on your site is mm-hmm. sustainable yeah. fashion. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, that, you know, we in previous episodes have talked about the challenge about sustainability in fashion where, you know, out of the 211 million metric tons of fiber that we produce, only 13% is available and sustainable. There's massive minimums. You have to jump through hoops. It's expensive. It therefore becomes this very exclusive conversation again when you really want it mm-hmm. to be kind of prevalent to save the world. Yeah. yeah. And so what you've done is kind of taken micro bites of sustainability through all these designers and in total, it's made an impact. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, sustainability for us and and it definitely has become a bit of a trendy word. And, yes, and, it is. And I always remind people sustainability and fashion are, you know, it's an oxymoron and it yes. doesn't work together. Right. But at the same time, um, the young designers we work with, they are sustainable by default. So th- they are so small that when you look at all these different sustain- sustainability practices or yes. different mm-hmm. characteristics for your business, they already work on a zero waste design because they cannot afford to waste um, um, things. They they work in a regional environment, so 
if you pay them or if they sell something, that money is spent regionally. They don't produce overseas. They don't have their products shipped around the world three times before they reach the end customer. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- by working or giving these small businesses a chance and then using the internet in, 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 a, in a very efficient way, we actually give those designers a voice and automatically provide an answer to you know the issues that we face in sustainability. So for us, sustainability is more a mindset rather than you know uh, a sort of you know than a, label. a crown. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Kind of like today, it has yeah. to be a journey. Yeah. That demand far exceeds supply in terms of raw materials. Yeah, you're talking. You know exactly. I was yeah. on a I was on a senior project kind of review, and there was a gal just so committed to sustainability. And the design was great, but the fabric choices were so horrendous because yeah. the limitation mm-hmm. in yeah. sustainable fabrics, you were like, you know, yeah. the, the result just didn't yeah. didn't work. And so, you know, I think as a mindset, as a journey, we all have to kind of go on that journey. You know, Gen Z seems to be singularly focused on sustainability. They think it's like a light switch. You yeah. can just turn it on and it exists. What percentage of your of your clients on on your platform are Gen Z? Are they embracing these designers and the yeah, stories so that they're telling? I, I think, you know, the good thing is as we evolve, as all the, our platform becomes, the younger mm-hmm. the, the designers who sign up. So in some way, we, we live in an ecosystem now where the Gen Z kids are our designers and they communicate directly to the Gen Z consumers. So what we sell is made by Gen Z for Gen Z. Mm-hmm. So in some way, again, you know, this is not a business strategy for us. For us, it's just we happen to be Gen Z kids, even if I've aged over the years and, yeah. and my team has aged, you know, and, and, and we as a business have been around, but Gen Z is not a strategy for us. It just means having more cool young designers signing up to the platform because they sell exactly the type of product that people on the streets want these days. Um, it's also and, something that many, many brands and retailers have been trying to figure out. Yeah. How do I how do I reach this new buying yeah. power? Yeah. No, and exactly. I mean, we, for the launch um, of the Zalando Partnership, when we did the podcast with, or sort of the, the live interview with Business, business of mm-hmm. Fashion, we spoke about that as well. It's, it's just... It, it cannot be another strategy. And, and as I said, sustainability cannot be a strategy. It needs to be a mindset. You need to be in touch with, with who your audience is. And, and I think what's working for us at the moment is the designers have spoken to us. They said, we no longer want to work in seasons. We don't want to take this huge risk of, you know, having 50 jackets sitting in our warehouse and we don't know if they're going to sell them because, you know, that's, that's the problem of, of, of fast fashion or fashion in general mm-hmm. where, you know, nobody really talks about, you know, the overstock and what happens if, if with all the product that is not sold. But the designers came to us and said, what if I can just send this item three weeks later? And and we looked at this, this you know, we, we kind of sort of spoke to a few customers and we realized if it's something special, then a customer is willing to wait, especially if it has been made for them, if there can be a certain customization mm-hmm. as well implemented into that process. And that's when we launched our marketplace. We implemented the made, or, made to order section. So on our website, if you go and there's a there's a section highlighted made to order, every single piece is not going to be delivered within two days, but more yeah. like in a week, two weeks, three weeks. On average, we actually looked, it's more like nine days, which is not not terrible. terrible. Yeah. 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 But you have a piece that has that did not exist before, which means the fabric is still in the roll. You know, they can do something else with that. They can sell it on. They can, you know, it, it's just not fashion that is wasted. And and I think that's exactly what Gen Z wants. So they know A, that the money they spend goes into the pocket of the designer. We take a cut, but the rest goes directly into the designer they've chosen on the platform. So if they say I want to buy from a designer in Ukraine, you know, to support what's going on over there, Mm -hmm. then here we go. Your financial impact, you know, can pay someone's salary for the next month. Then um, this piece will be made as soon as the order comes in. That means you will be directly put into touch with the designer. Now, when do you ever have this interaction between a creative and and you as a consumer? Never. Unless you go to Paris and buy a $50,000 Dior dress. You know, then yeah, for haute couture dress, you might have this interaction where something is made for mm-hmm. you. Um, 
And and then finally, yeah, you get something sent to your house um, that is special that nobody else has. And I think that provides a completely different story than anyone else has. And we always talk about evolution. And what's wild thinking through this process is you sort of have an artist's hive mentality. It updates itself. It evolves itself because the workers, if you will, you know, the artists, if you will, are communicating upwards and you're kind of evolving along that path. It's kind yeah. of like organically intentional yeah. if there is such a thing. Yeah. You know, and it's funnily, amazing. The, the people who select the designers who end up on our Instagram and, and homepage are, and people are always surprised, they're extremely young. So they usually I pick even interns to do that because their, their choices just surprise me. And I often don't like it. And then I realize, hold on, this is what these designers are doing right now. These are the colors they're using. These are the shoes they're wearing. That's the style, that's the haircut, the type of model they are choosing. I just have to let them do their thing and, and I don't get involved in that. Kind of really makes me think of really the beginning of fashion. You know, it's it's it was all one of a kind. It was built for an individual. So it's it's kind of like you're returning to the to the beginning. Yeah. I mean, it's almost, you know, medieval times you yeah. go to the maker and, and we've missed that, you know, and I think mm-hmm. uh, if, if, we can, if we can shift the mind of consumers a little bit to expect that, then I think people will buy less, they will buy more special pieces, they will spend their money in a different way and they keep things longer as well. I mean, yeah. I'm sure, you know, I grew up with pieces that I have inherited from my parents and they've mm-hmm. inherited from their parents. So... It's just I think we need to go back to that process where people but your, want to. Your, where you were born, where you were raised is Italy. And yeah. every time I go to Italy, it's a completely different mentality. Yeah. It's an investment in a piece of clothing that you keep for a long time. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the conversation we had in an earlier podcast where is America, this vast consumer nation, disposable clothing, are they evolving enough where they're going to spend a little bit yeah. more on a piece and wear it yeah. longer and quality it's being becomes more important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, it's, it all has to do with culture. You know, if, if that culture is available to you, then you and, and people understand it and they will act in a certain way. And, and I think, you know, yes, you know, I'm obviously lucky to have, you know, to have seen fashion in Italy and that, yeah. you know, that's mm-hmm. where people yeah. appreciate every piece that they wear. They do. And you don't buy cheap, you buy something that you can, that right. lasts forever. But you know, it doesn't mean you. it's impossible to do the same here in America. And things, you know, and culture change so quickly. And look at where we are with food. You know, I remember like 20 years ago, you would, you know, I can say this as an Italian, you would come to the U.S. and people like, ooh, you know, like, mm-hmm. did you eat fast food every day? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now you eat better food here than in Europe, you know, and, and things well, I evolve, don't know. you know. I yeah. have my favorites in <laughs> Florence. I don't know if they yeah. compete to the U.S. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it has changed, you yeah. know, there's a culture towards, you know, really like, you know, regional and, and homemade right. and, and right. great food. And, and yeah. if you want it, it's out there. You're right. And, and, and I think we just have to do the same thing for fashion. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing more about this of course. wonderful platform and opportunity that you've created for designers. Um, and you know, best best of luck as this platform continues to evolve and grow. Thank you. Yeah. And good luck on future decisions. I know yeah. you're you're Big thinking through the evolution up. that you're going to go yeah. through. Yeah. And thank yeah. you for bringing Ranger along, your yeah. wonderful German <laughs> Shepherd. Yeah. If you're watching our episode, you'll see this glorious <laughs> dog popping in and out of the scene. So thanks again. <laughs> Make sure to subscribe and stay apprised of upcoming episodes of Clothing Culture. 